Hello YouTube, my name is Neil. We're studying for the MCATs today, biology. We are in chapter two, reproduction. All mammals share certain characteristics, milk producing mammary glands, three bones in the middle ear and one in the lower jaw, fur or hair, heterodont dentition, dentition, heterodont dentition, different kinds of teeth, and both sebaceous, oil producing, and sudoriferous sweat glands. What about placenta? Formation during embryonic development. This is a characteristic of humans, as we'll explore in chapter 3. But there are two groups of mammals that birth their young a bit differently. Prototherians and metatherians. Prototherians, monotremes, which include the duck-billed platypus and ech echidna, spiny anteater, in case they're developing embryos within hard-shelled amniotic eggs and lay them to be hatched like reptiles. This method of development is referred to as oviparity. Uh, metatherians, marsupials, include koalas and kangaroos. A typical metatherian fetus, Joey, undergoes some development in its mother's uterus and then climbs its way out of the birth canal and into her marsupium, or pouch. It might seem a bit strange that something as essential as reproduction could be so different between mammalian species, but the truth is that there is a wide variety of reproductive mechanisms in nature. Many organisms, it, yeah, many organisms reproduce without a sexual partner. Others can reproduce sexually or asexually, depending on environmental conditions. In chapter one, we explored how bacteria and viruses reproduce. In this chapter, we'll explore how uh, eukaryotic cells reproduce, as well as the male and female reproductive systems. Do I need to write any of this down? Do we need to remember sebaceous or sodoriferous? Or prototherians and metatherians. Prototherians, the uh, platypus, duckbill platypus. Metatherians, the marsupials. All right. Prototherians are monotremes. All right. I don't think that's essential. It's just some background. In animals, autosomal cells are said to be diploid, 2N, which means that they contain two copies of each chromosome. Germ cells, on the other hand, are haploid, containing only one copy of each chromosome. In humans, these numbers are 46 and 23 respectively. We inherit 23 chromosomes from each parent. Eukaryotic cells replicate through the cell cycle, a specific series of phases during which a cell grows, synthesizes DNA, and divides. Uh, derangements of the cell cycle can lead to unchecked cell division and may be responsible for the formation of cancer. The cell cycle, shown in figure 2.1, is a perennial MCAT favorite. For actively dividing cells, the cell cycle consists of four stages, G1, S, G2, and M. The first three stages, G1, S, and G2, are known collectively as interphase. G1, S, G2, Interphase is the longest part of the cell cycle. Even actively dividing cells spend about 90% of their time in interphase. 90%. Cells that do not divide spend all their time in an offshoot of G1 called G0. We also got G0 over here. During the G0 stage, the cell is simply living and serving its function without any preparation for division. During interphase, individual chromosomes are not visible with light microscopy. Rather, they 
are in a less condensed form known as chromatin. This is because the DNA must be available to RNA polymerase so that genes can be transcribed. During mitosis, however, it is preferable to condense the DNA into tightly coiled chromosomes to avoid losing any genetic material during cell division. Let's put a header up here. G1 stage, presynthetic gap. During the G1 stage, cells create organelles for energy and protein during uh, protein production, uh, mitochondria, ribosomes, and endoplasmic reticulum, while each increasing their size. In addition, passage into the S synthesis stage is governed by a restriction point. Certain criteria, such as containing the pr proper complement of DNA, must be met for the cell to pass the restriction point and enter the synthesis stage. So during G1, uh, we have growth. And there's a check or a restriction point. S stage is a synthesis of D... Uh, so at the restriction point, I wanted to write down that DNA uh, has to be complemented. For example, for DNA. In... Look... During the S stage, the cell replicates its genetic material so that each daughter cell will have identical copies. So this is just the, the fact that it has a proper complement. So this is a 2N. They don't use a big N, they use a little N. Uh, after replication, each chromosome consists of two identical chromatids. They are bound together at a centralized region known as the centromere. as shown in figure 2.2. Note that the ploidy of the cell does not change even though the number of chromatids has doubled. In other words, humans in this stage still only have 46 chromosomes even though 92 chromatids are present. Cells entering G2 have twice as much DNA as cells in G1. So it'll go from 2N to 4N During the G2 stage, the cell passes through another quality control checkpoint. DNA has been duplicated, and the cell checks to ensure that there are enough organelles and cytoplasm to divide between two daughter cells. Furthermore, the cell checks to make sure that DNA replication proceeds correctly to avoid passing on an error to daughter cells that may further replicate the error uh, in their progeny. Uh, so we have another check. Check uh, sufficient organelles and uh, DNA. 
I'm going to put 4n here, even though they said that it's not, uh, yeah, the ploidy doesn't really change. Uh, so I'm going to put quotes around that. M stage is mitosis. The M stage consists of mitosis itself along with cytokinesis. Mitosis is divided into four phases. Mitosis and cytokinesis. You have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. The features of each phase will be discussed in each in the next section. Cytokinesis is the splitting of the cytoplasm and organelles into daughter cells. Splitting. Of cytoplasm. Control of the cell cycle. They don't go into each of the, yeah, they go into prophase, each of these separately. Uh, all right, control of the cell cycle. Uh, cell cycle is controlled by checkpoints, most notably between G1 and S and the G2 and M phase. So this is also between G2 and M. At the G1S checkpoint, the cell determines if the DNA is in good condition for synthesis. As mentioned above, this checkpoint is also known as the restriction point if there has been damage to the DNA. The cell cycle goes into a rest until the DNA has been repaired. The main protein in control of this is known as P53. So let's just put this over here, P53. At the G2M checkpoint, the cell is mainly concerned with ensuring that the cell has achieved adequate size and the organelles have been properly replicated to support two daughter cells. P53 also plays a role at the G2M checkpoint. All right. The molecules responsible for the cell cycle are known as cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases. So uh, we'll come back to prophase. Cyclins and cyclin dependent. In order to be activated, CDKs require the presence of the right cyclins. During the cell cycle, concentrations of the various cyclins increase and decrease during specific stages. These cyclins bind to CDKs, creating an active CDK cyclin complex. This complex can then Phosphorylate transcription factors. Transcription factors then promote transcription of genes required for the next stage of the cell. So they make a complex and phosphorylate transcription factors. Cancer. Cell cycle control is essential to ensure that cells that are damaged or inadequately sized do not divide. When cell cycle control becomes deranged and damaged cells are allowed to undergo mitosis, cancer may result. One of the most common mutations found in cancer is mutation of the gene that produces P53, called TP53. When this gene is mutated, the cell cycle is not stopped to repair uh, 
damaged DNA. This allows mutations to accumulate, eventually resulting in a cancer cell that divides continuously and without regard to the quality or quantity of the new cells produced. Often cancer cells undergo rapid cell division, creating tumors. Eventually, if the cell begins to produce the right factors, such as proteases that can digest basement membranes or factors that encourage blood vessel formation, uh, the damaged cells are then able to reach other tissues. This may include both local invasion as well as distant spread of cancerous cells throughout the bloodstream or lymphatic systems. This later result is known as metastasis. Spread of cancer, spread of tumor, I guess. Mitosis, shown in figure 2.3, is the process by which two identical daughter cells are created from a single cell. Mitosis consists of four distinct phases. Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase and occurs in somatic cells or cells that are not involved in sexual reproduction. Want to remember that, somatic cells. Prophase is the first phase in mitosis. The first step in prophase involves condensation In, of the chromatin into chromosomes. Also, the centriole pairs separate and move toward opposite poles of the cell. Uh, the these paired cylindrical organelles shown in figure 2.4 are located outside the nucleus in a region known as the centrosome and are responsible for uh, the correct division of DNA. Once the centrioles migrate to opposite poles of the cell, they begin to form spindle fibers. which are made of microtubules. Uh, this defines uh, the centrosome as one of the two microtubule organizing centers of the cell, the other being the basal body of a flagellum or cilium. Each of the fibers radiates outwards from the centrioles. Some microtubules form asters that anchor the centrioles to the cell membrane. Asters. Others extend toward the middle of the cell. Uh, the nuclear membrane dissolves during prophase, allowing these spindle fibers to contact the chromosomes. The nucleoli become less distinct and may disappear completely. Kinetochores appear at the centromere. So let's write down that the nucleus dissipates, dissolves, Nucleus dissolves, kinetochores appear at the centromere. Kinetochores are protein structures located on the centromere that serve as attachment points for specific fibers of the spindle apparatus, appropriately called kinetochore fibers. Right, so uh, attachment points. All right, metaphase. 
In metaphase, the centriole pairs are now at opposite ends of the cell. The kinetochore fibers interact with the fibers of the spindle apparatus to align the chromosomes at the metaphase plate, equatorial plate, which is a equidistant, which is equidistant between the two poles of the cell. Metaphase. Chromosomes aligned at metaphase plate, anaphase. During anaphase, the centromere split so that each chromatid has its own distinct centromere thus allowing the sister chromatids to separate. The sister chromatids are pulled up towards the opposite poles of the cell by the shortening of the kinetochore fibers. So I'll just write down chromatids separate. by the shortening of the kinetochore fibers in telophase. Uh, telophase is essentially the reverse of prophase. The spindle apparatus disappears. Spindle disappears. Uh, a nuclear membrane forms around each set of chromosomes. and the nucleoli reappear. Uh, the chromosomes uncoil, resuming their interphase form. Each of the two new nuclei has received a complete copy of the genome identical to the original genome and to each other. At the end of telophase, cytokinesis is the separation of the cytoplasm and organelles so that each daughter cell has sufficient supplies to survive on its own. Each cell undergoes a finite number of divisions before programmed death. For human somatic cells, this is usually between 20 to 50. After that, the cell can no longer divide continuously. Oh, so you only get 20 to 50 lives. Now, uh... All right, what are the five stages of the cell cycle? What happens in each phase? Uh, prophase, sister or chromatids condense, uh, centriole, centriole movement, uh, spindle fibers attaching to uh, chromosomes. Uh, the nuclear envelope dissolves uh, in metaphase. Chromosomes align at the metaphase plate. Anaphase, chromatids separate by the contraction of the kinetochores, or the spindle fibers, rather. In telophase, uh, the spindle disappears, nuclear membrane forms, chromosomes uncoil. Uh, there you go. Cytokinesis is where, when the, uh, I should have written cytokinesis down here too, huh? Splitting of cytoplasm.
There you go, cytokinesis. All right. Meiosis. Whereas meiosis, or whereas mitosis, rather, Meiosis. Whereas mitosis occurs in somatic tissue and results in two identical daughter cells, meiosis occurs in gamma, uh, gametocytes, 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 or germ cells, and results in up to four non identical sex cells, gametes. All right. Gametocyte is a germ cell and and gametes are the sex cells themselves. So germ cells are cells that produce sex cells. Meiosis shares some similarities with mitosis. In both processes, for instance, genetic material must be duplicated. Chromatin is condensed to form chromosomes, and microtubules emanating from centrioles are involved in dividing genetic material. However, the MCAT tends to ask about the differences between these two processes. In contrast to mitosis, which consists of one round each of replication and division, meiosis consists of one round of replication fo followed by two rounds of division. As shown in figure 2.5, uh, meiosis 1 results in homologous chromosomes being separated, uh, generating haploid daughter cells. This is known as reductional division. Let's write that down. Meiosis 1. Reductional division. Meiosis 2 is similar to mitosis in that it results in the separation of sister chromatids and is known as equational division. Meiosis 2. Meiosis 1. The human genome is composed of 23 homologous pairs of chromosomes, or homologs, each of which contain one chromosome inherited from each parent. This brings up an important note about terminology. Whereas homologous pairs are considered separate chromosomes, such as maternal chromosome 15 and paternal chromosome 15, sister chromatids are identical strains of DNA connected to the centromere. Thus, after S phase, there are 92 chromatids organized into 46 chromosomes, which are organized into 23 homologous pairs. All right. Sister chromatids don't increase the uh, N aploidy. All right. Prophase one. During prophase 1, the chromatin condenses into chromosomes. The spindle apparatus forms, and the nucleoli and nuclear membrane disappear. That sounds like a prophase from mitosis, doesn't it? The first major difference between meiosis and mitosis occurs at this point. Homologous chromosomes come together and intertwine in a process called synapsis.
At this point, each chromosome consists of two sister chromatids. So each synaptic pair contains four chromatids and is referred to as a tetrad. The homologous chromosomes are held together by a group of proteins called the synapton synaptonemal complex. Chromatids of homologous chromosomes may break at the point of contact called the chiasma, or chiasmata, for plural, and exchange equivalent pieces of DNA. As shown in figure 2.6, this process is called crossing over and can be characterized by the number of crossover events that occur in one strand of DNA, including single crossovers and double crossovers. Note that crossing over occurs between homologous chromosomes and not between sister chromatids of the same chromosome. Uh, the latter are identical, so crossing over would not produce any change. Those chromatids involved are left with an altered but structurally complete set of genes. Such genetic recombination can unlink linked genes, thereby increasing the variety of genetic combinations that can be produced via gametogenesis. Linkage refers to the tendency for genes to be inherited together. Genes that are located farther from each other physically are less likely to be inherited together and more likely to undergo crossing over relative to each other. Thus, as opposed to asexual reproduction, which produces identical offspring, sexual reproduction provides the advantage of greater genetic diversity, which is believed to increase the ability of a species to evolve and adapt to a changing environment. All right. So I'm going to write down that uh, Tetrad's got the synapse. Donimal complex and chiasma Contact. Uh, then we have crossing over. Recombination. And uh, Yeah. And let's mark down that it's between homologs, not chromatids. Not between sister chromatids, but between homolog pairs. Homolog pairs are not identical. Sister chromatids are identical. Right. Because of crossing over, each daughter cell will have a unique pool of alleles, or genes coding for alternative forms of a given strait given trait. So let's mark this down over here. Allows. Coding genes. Because of crossing over, each data cell will have a unique pool of alleles, genes coding for alternative forms of a given trait. Uh, from a random mixture of maternal and paternal origin. In classical genetics, crossing over explains Mendel's second law of independent assortment, 
which states that the inheritance of one allele, 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 allele has no effect on the likelihood of inheriting certain alleles for other genes. So that's all prophase. Next, metaphase one. During metaphase one, homologous pairs or tetrads align at the metaphase plate. And each pair uh, attaches to a separate spindle fiber by its kinetto core. Note the difference from mitosis. In mitosis, each chromosome is lined up on the metaphase plate by two spindle fibers, one from each pole. In meiosis, homologous chromosomes are linked up across from each other at the metaphase plate and are held by one spindle fiber. Let's put that down. Uh, one fiber. Anaphase 1. During anaphase 1, homologous pairs separate and are pulled to opposite poles of the cell. This process is called disjunction. And it accounts for Mendel's first law of segregation. So maybe we should write down that, yeah, Mendel's second law. Uh, so this uh, crossover recombination is, independent of sort. And this part over here is segregation. During disjunction, each chromosome of paternal origin separates or disjoins from its homologue of maternal origin. And either chromosome can end up in either daughter cell. Thus, the distribution of homologous chromosomes to the two immediate daughter cells is random with respect to parental origin. Uh, this separating of two homo homolog homologous chromosomes is referred to as segregation. Disjunction is what they called it. Telophase one. During telophase one, a nuclear membrane forms around each new nucleus. At this point, each chromosome still consists of two sister chromatids joined at the centromere. The cells are now haploid. Once homologous chromosomes separate, only M chromosomes are found in each daughter cell, 23 in humans. The cell divides into two daughter cells by cytokinesis between cell divisions. There may be a short rest period or interkinesis during which the chromosomes partially uncoil. So I uh, said something incorrect earlier that this is... Uh, Two n up here, because that's not technically correct. I'm just gonna take this out. There's chromatids, but uh, we learned that there are 96 chromatids, but that's not how that's not ploidy number. So I'm incorrectly used ploidy number here, because they're telling us that uh, sister chromatids is just 23. Uh, the tetrad is 46. Is 2n.
this is not 2n, this is n. Here we have a 2n phase before. Now it's back to 1n, but up here it's 2n. All right, haploid or er, uh, ploidy. During telophase, same thing happens as telophase in uh, mitosis. But we could write down a little something. Uh, let's just write reverse. No, because uh, we still have centromeres attached to cells or attached to chromosomes. Membrane forms centromeres still attached to chromosomes. Now back to N. And before cytokinesis, there may be interkinesis. Interkinesis, which is a, a rest period. Should I just write rest period? Rest period. It needs a little rest. And cytokinesis. Because, yeah, cytokinesis happens before, uh, yeah, before mitosis, too, right? Meiosis, too. Is very similar to mitosis and that sister chromatids rather than homologs are separated from each other. In prophase two, the nuclear envelope dissolves, nucleoli disappear, the centrioles migrate to opposite poles and the spindle apparatus begins to form. During metaphase two, the chromosomes line up on the metaphase plate During anaphase two, the centromeres divide, separating the chromosomes into sister chromatids. These chromatids are pulled to opposite poles by spindle fibers. And finally, in telophase two, uh, a nuclear membrane forms around each new nucleus. Cytokinesis follows, and two daughter cells are formed. Thus, by completion of meiosis two, up to four haploid daughter cells are produced per gamete, gametocyte. We use the phrase up to because oogenesis, discussed later in this chapter, may result in fewer than four cells if an egg remains unfertilized after ovulation. All right. What is the ploidy of the daughter cells produced from meiosis one, from meiosis two? In meiosis one, by the end of meiosis one, you already have N. At the end of meiosis two, you still have N, you just don't have sister chromatids. What is the difference between homologous chromosomes and sister chromatids? The difference is that homologous chromosomes aren't identical. You get one from your father and one from your mother, and so they're different. Oh, no, you don't get one from your mother and one from your father. You give one either as a mother or a father. But the chromosomes that you get
Yeah, I guess you do. Yeah, you get one from each of your parents. Uh, sister chromatids are identical because they're the two halves of the same chromosome. Sister chromatids, for each phase of meiosis one listed below, what are the di differences from the analogous phases of mitosis? From meiosis one to mitosis. Prophase still have a uh, You still have the dissolving of the nuclear envelope and the centromeres or centrioles. Centrioles or centromeres? Spindle fiber, rather. What did I write up here? Centromeres or centrosomes? Mitosis. Centrioles, centrioles make spindle fibers. Yeah, centrioles, centrosomes. All right, prophase one, uh, you still have the centrosome movement, centriole movement, rather. Difference is chromosomes intertwine, synapsis, uh, and you have tetrads instead of sister, you know, just sister chromatids. Uh, in this step, you can have crossover or recombination. In metaphase, uh, tetrads align at the metaphase plate rather than uh, sister chromatids. And you have one fiber instead of two. In anaphase, uh, disjunction, pairs are separated. Uh, this is in anaphase one. In anaphase, in mitosis, you have sister chromatids being pulled apart. In telophase one, uh, basically you have the same situation except centromeres stay attached to the chromosomes. Uh, yeah, let's check uh, that hap or that ploidy number question. We'll make sure nailed it. Let's see. Uh, after meiosis one, there are two haploid daughter cells. After meiosis two, oh wait, this one homologous homologous chromosomes are related to chromosomes of opposite parental origin, such as maternal chromosome fifteen and paternal fifteen, or in males. Uh, the X and Y chromosomes. Sister chromatids are identical copies of the same DNA that are held together at the centromere. After S phase, the cell contains 92 chromatids, 46 chromosomes, and 23 homologous pairs. Oh, what is a ploidy? Number one, after meiosis, there are two haploid daughter cells. After meiosis two, there are up to four haploid gametes. The ploidy is that they are haploid in both case, two haploid daughter cells and four haploid gametes. So they're haploid in both case, but they, uh, they gave you the number. Two daughter cells in the case of meiosis one, four in the case of meiosis two. All right. The reproductive system. Biological sex is determined by the 23rd pair of chromosomes, with XX being female and XY being male. An ovum can only carry the X chromosome, while sperm can carry either the X or Y chromosome. 
The X chromosome carries a size, uh, sizable amount of genetic information. Mutations in this gene, in these genes, can cause sex-linked, X-linked disorders. Males are termed hemizygous with respect to many of the genes on the X chromosome because they can only have one copy. Therefore, a male with a disease-causing allele on the unpaired part of X chromosome will necessarily express that allele. Females, on the other hand, may be homozygous or heterozygous with respect to genes on the X chromosome. Most x linked disorders are recessively inherited. Therefore, females express these disorders far less frequently than males. Females carrying a diseased allele on an X chromosome may not, but not exhibiting the disease are said to be carriers. Comparatively, the Y chromosome contains very little con genetic information. One notable gene on the Y chromosome is SRY, sex determining region Y. All right. Reproductive system. Hemizygous versus homozygous or homozygous. For sex chromosomes, men are hemizygous. Women are homozygous. Uh, for other things, they can be heterozygous. Comparatively, the Y chromosome contains very little genetic information. One notable gene on the Y chromosome is SRY, sex to Determining region, sex determining region Y, which codes for a transcription factor that initiates testes differentiation and thus the formation of male gonads. Therefore, in the absence of the Y chromosome, all zygotes will be female. In the presence of the Y chromosome, a zygote will be male. Sex determining region is what differentiates males. In males, the primitive gonads developed into develop into the testes. The testes have two functional components: the seminiferous tubules and the interstitial cells of Leydig. Male have seminiferous tubules and interstitial cells of Leydig, Leydig cells. Sperm are produced in the highly coiled seminiferous tubules where they are nour nourished by Sertoli cells. Sperm production Sertoli cells. The cells of Leydig secrete testosterone and other male sex hormones, androgens. The testes are located in the scrotum, which is an external pouch that hangs below the penis and maintains a temperature 2 degrees to 4 degrees 
lower than the body. In fact, there is a layer of muscle around the vas deferens, ductus deferens, that can raise and lower the testes to maintain the proper temperature for sperm development. As sperm are formed, they are passed to the epididymis, where their flagella gain motility. That's Flagella and motility, and they are stored until ejaculation. Storage. During ejaculation, sperm travel through the vas deferens to the ejaculatory duct. Vas deferens, ejaculatory duct, at the posterior edge of the prostate gland. The two ejaculatory ducts then fuse to form the urethra, which carries sperm through the penis as they exit the body. In males, the reproductive and urinary systems share a common pathway. This is not the case in females. As sperm pass through the reproductive tract, they are mixed with seminal fluid, which is produced through a combined effort by the seminal vesicles, prostate gland, and bulborethral gland. Let's write that down. Seminal fluid is made by seminal vesicles, prostate, and oborethral gland. The seminal vesicles contribute fructose to nourish sperm and both the seminal vesicles and prostate gland give the fluid mildly alkaline properties so the sperm will be able to survive in the relatively relative acidity of the female reproductive tract. The bulbourethral bulbo or cowper's glands produce a clear viscous fluid that cleans out any remnant of urine and lubricates the urethra during sexual arousal. The combination of sperm and seminal fluid is known as semen. Should we write some of these down? I'm just going to add stuff like uh, seminal vesicles, fructose. Good to know. Seminal vesicles and prostate uh, give the fluid alkalinity and Cowper's gland makes lubrication. Great. Spermatogenesis. As mentioned above, spermatogenesis, the formation of haploid sperm through meiosis, occurs in the seminiferous tubules. Where were we with the seminiferous tubules? Down here. I don't have it on here, but it's in the testes, I guess. Uh, right. In males, the Diploid stem cells are known as spermatogonia. <laughs> so spermatogonia are diploid cells. After replicating their genetic material, they develop into 
diploid primary spermatocytes. So they turn into primary spermatocytes. The first meiotic division will result in haploid secondary spermatocytes. And at this point, they are haploid. Then undergo meiosis II to generate haploid spermatids. Spermatids. Finally, the spermatids undergo maturation and become mature spermatozoa. Spermatogenesis results in four functional sperm for each spermatogonium. So, let's also put down stages in here, that this is going to be a S stage, this is going to be after My else is two. No, that's my else is one. Meiosis one, and here is going to be meiosis two. And then you get spermatids that develop in a spermatozoa. Great. Mature sperm are very compact. They consist of a head containing the genetic material, a midpiece which generates ATP from fructose, and a flagellum for motility. As shown in figure 2.8, the midpiece is filled with mitochondria which generate the energy to be used as the sperm swims through the female reproductive tract to reach the ovum in the fallopian tubes. Each sperm head is covered by a cap known as an acrosome. The structure is derived from the Golgi apparatus and is necessary to penetrate the ovum. Once a male reaches sexual maturity during puberty, approximately 3 million sperm are produced per day throughout the rest of life. So let's write down uh, acrosome. It's a cap to penetrate ovum. Let's also write down three million sperm per day. Unlike the male reproductive system, All of the female reproductive organs are internal. As shown in figure 2.9, the gonads, known as ovaries, produce estrogen and progesterone. The ovaries are located in the pelvic cavity. Each consists of thousands of follicles, which are multi-layered sacs that contain nourish and protect immature ova. 
follicles to contain ova, which are eggs. Between puberty and menopause, one egg per month is ovulated in the peritoneal sac. which lines the abdominal cavity. It, then, it is then drawn into the fallopian tube or oviduct, which is lined with cilia to propel the egg forward. Fallopian tubes are connected to the muscular uterus, which is the site of fetal development. The lower end of the uterus, known as the cervix, connects to the vaginal cana canal where sperm are deposited during intercourse. The vagina is also the passageway through which childbirth occurs. The external female anatomy is known collectively as the vulva. As mentioned earlier, females have separate excretory and reproductive tracts. Eugenesis. The production of female gametes as known, is known as oogenesis. Although gametes undergo the same mitotic process in both females and males, there are some significant differences between the two sexes. First, there is no unending supply of stem cells analogous to spermatogonia in females. All of the oogonia a woman will have are formed during fetal development. By birth, all of the ogonia have already undergone DNA replication and are considered primary oocytes. These cells are 2N, like primary spermatocytes, and are actually arrested in prophase 1. Once a woman reaches menarche, her first menstrual cycle, uh, one primary oocyte per month will complete meiosis one, producing a secondary oocyte and a polar body. So they start out there in... Uh, Pro phase one. Once a month, they're gonna they're gonna go meiosis and this is meiosis one to become secondary oocytes and a polar body. The division is characterized by unequal cytokinesis, which doles ample cytoplasm to one daughter cell, the secondary oocyte, and nearly none to the other, the polar body. Oh, so there's a oocyte and polar body. And underneath we'll put unequal the unequal cytokinesis. The polar body generally does not divide any further and will never produce functional gametes. The secondary oocyte, on the other hand, remains arrested in metaphase 2 and does not complete the remainder of meiosis 2 until fertilization. So while it was arrested in prophase one up here, now it's arrested in metaphase.
space to Oocytes are surrounded by two layers, the zona pellucida and the corona radiata. radiata. Yeah, let's write these down. Zona pellucida. The zona pellucida surrounds the oocyte itself and is an acellular matrix of glycoproteins that protect the oocyte and contain compounds necessary for sperm cell binding. Glycoproteins. The corona radiata lies outside the zona pellucida and is a layer of cells that adhere to the oocyte during ovulation. Meiosis II is triggered when a sperm cell penetrates these layers with the help of acrosomal enzymes. The secondary oocyte undergoes a second meiotic division to split into a mature ovum and another polar body, which will eventually be broken down. A mature ovum is a very large cell consisting of large quantities of cytoplasm and organelles. Indeed, the ovum contributes nearly everything to the zygote. Half of the DNA and all of the cyto cytoplasm organelles, including mitochondria, RNA, for early cellular processes and physical space. Whereas sperm only contribute half of the DNA upon completion of meiosis II, the haploid pronuclei of the sperm and the ovum join, creating a diploid zygote. All right, uh, so when, when the oocyte is fertilized and my meiosis two is triggered, Meiosis II is triggered by fertilization. It undergoes the second meiotic division, makes another polar body, just to stay consistent. Meiosis II is triggered by fertilization. Uh, you get an ovum and another polar body. Upon completion of meiosis II, the haploid Pronuclei of the sperm and the ovum join, creating a diploid zygote. So after meiosis II is done, the ovum and the nuclear the ovum and the sperm actually join. So the sperm triggers meiosis II on the outside of the cell, but by the time it gets into the cell and combines with the ovum, meiosis II is already finished. All right. 
So fertilization is just the sperm entering the outside of the egg. Uh, what do we call this process of the sperm in the ovum joining? Yeah, an ovum. Plus sperm equals pronuclei. Oh, wait, the pronuclei is the sperm, sorry. Pronuclei of the sperm and ovum. Join creating a diploid zygote. But ovum is also a pronuclei, right? Maybe not. Creating a diploid. Diploid. Zygote. All right. Sexual development. The ability to reproduce is under hormonal control. Prior to puberty, the hypothalamus restricts production of gonadotropin-releasing hormone. Gonadotropin-releasing hormone. At the start of puberty, this restriction is lifted as the hypothalamus release, releases pulses of GnRH, which then triggers the anti-pituitary gland to synthesize and release follicle stimulating hormone, which is FSH. I'm going to write this to gonadotropin releasing hormone and luteinizing luteinizing hormone. LH. These hormones trigger the production of other sex hormones that develop and maintain the reproductive system. Follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, gonadotropin releasing hormone, male sexual development. During the fetal period, During the fetal period, from nine weeks after fertilization until birth, presence of the Y chromosome leads to production of androgens, resulting in male sexual differentiation. For the duration of infancy and childhood, androgen production is low. Testosterone produced by the testes increases dramatically during puberty, and sperm production it begins. In order to achieve this, there is a delicate interplay of FSH and LH stimulating stimulation on two cell types in the testes. FSH stimulates the Sertoli cells and triggers sperm maturation, whereas LH causes the interstitial cells to produce testosterone. LH 
causes interstitial cells to make testosterone. Testosterone not, <coughs> not only develops <coughs> and maintains the male reproductive system, but also results in the development of secondary sexual characteristics, such as facial and auxiliary hair, deepening of the voice, and changes in growth patterns. Testosterone production remains high through adulthood and declines as men age. This hormone exerts negative feedback on the hypothalamus and interior pituitary so that production is limited to appropriate levels. Negative feedback. Female sexual development in the ovaries, uh, the ovaries which are de derived from the same embryonic structures as the testes, are also under control of FSIH and LH, secreted by the anterior pituitary. The ovaries produce estrogens and progesterone. Estrogens are secreted in response to FSH. And they result in the development and maintenance of the female reproductive system and female secondary sexual characteristics. Uh, breast growth, widening of the hips, changes in fat distribution. In the embryo, estrogens stimulate development of the reproductive tract. In adults, estrogens lead to the thickening of the lining of the uterus, endometrium, each month in preparation for the implantation of a zygote. So estrogen is for sex characteristics as well as Estrogen is responsible for sex characteristics and endometrium thickening. Progesterone is secreted by the corpus luteum, the remnant follicle that remains after ovulation in response to LH. Progesterone. By the... Corpus luteum or remnant follicle. Interestingly, Progesterone is involved in the development and maintenance of the endometrium, but not in the initial thickening of the endometrium. This is the role of estrogen. This means that both estrogen and progesterone are required for the generation, development, and maintenance of an endometrium capable of supporting a zygote. By the end of the first trimester of pregnancy, progesterone is supplied by the placenta and the corpus luteum atrophies and ceases to function. All right. Endometrium maintenance
progesterone. Production taken over by placenta by the second trimester. All right, the menstrual cycle. During the reproductive years, from menarche to menopause, estrogen and progesterone levels rise and fall in a cyclic pattern. In response, the endometrial lining will grow and be shed. This is known as the menstrual cycle and can be divided into four events, as shown in figure 2.10, the follicular phase, ovulation, the luteal phase, and menstruation. All right. The follicular phase begins when the menstrual flow which sheds the uterine lining of the previous cycle begins. Follicular phase. Menstrual flow. GnRH. Secretion from the hypothalamus increases in response to the decreased concentrations of estrogen and progesterone, which falls off toward the end of each cycle. Because of low So GnRH secretion from the hypothalamus increases in response to the decreased concentration of estrogen and progesterone, which fall off towards the end of the cycle. The higher concentrations of GnRH cause increased secretions of both FSH and LH. These two hormones work in concert to develop several ovarian follicles. Follicles begin to produce estrogen, which has negative feedback effects and causes the GnRH, LH, and FSH concentrations to level off. Estrogen works to regrow the endometrial lining, stimulating vascularization and granularization of the decidua. So GnHR causes FSH and LH so this leads to development which then leads to estrogen. Which causes negative feedback on all of GnRH. F, S, H, and L, H. And uh, decidua, endometrial lining, 
Is that right? All right. Ovulation. So this follicular phase is just seven days. Estrogen is interesting in that it can have both negative and positive feedback effects. Late in the follicular phase, the developing follicles secrete higher and higher concentrations of estrogen. Eventually, estrogen concentrations reach a threshold that paradoxically, paradoxically results in positive feedback, and GnRH, LH, and FSH levels spike. The surge in LH is important. It induces ovulation and release of the ovum from the ovary into the abdominal peritoneal cavity. All right, so in ovulation, estrogen has positive feedback on GnRH, LH, and FSH. So level spike. So these all go up, and specifically LH induces ovulation, which is technically the release of the ovum. into the peritoneal cavity. In the luteal phase, after ovulation, LH causes ruptured follicle uh, to form the corpus luteum, which secretes progesterone. Remember that estrogen helps regenerate uh, the uterine lining, but it is progesterone that maintains it for implantation. Progesterone levels begin to rise while estrogen levels remain high. The high levels of progesterone, again, cause negative feedback on GnRH, FSH, and LH, preventing the ovulation of multiple eggs. All right. So the follicle becomes corpus luteum. which makes progesterone. And progesterone does some Negative feedback in this case. On G N R H L H F S H. And we'll put down here preventing. No, it's not right. I like that. Preventing multiple eggs. All right. Luteal phase. FSH and LH go down, preventing multiple eggs from being ovulated. In the menstruation phase. Assuming that implantation does not occur, the corpus luteum loses its stimulation from LH, progesterone levels decline, and the uterine lining is sloughed off. Loss of high levels of estrogen and progesterone removes the block on GnRH so that the next cycle can begin.
So progesterone goes down. And the lining is slowed. Sloth. Slowed, as they say. Pregnancy. Alternatively, on the other hand, if fertilization has occurred, the resulting zygote will develop into a blastocyst. that will implant in the uterine lining and secrete human chorionic gonadotropin. Human chorionic gonadotropin, or HCG. This hormone is an analog of LH, meaning that it looks very similar chemically and can stimulate LH receptors. This maintains the corpus luteum. The HCG is critical during first trimester development because it is the estrogen progesterone secreted by the corpus luteum that can that keep the uterine lining in place. By the second trimester, HCG levels decline because the placenta has grown to a sufficient size to secrete progesterone and estrogen by itself. The high levels of estrogen and progesterone continue to serve as a negative feedback me mechanism, preventing further GnRH secretion. So blastosis makes HCG, which takes over for LH in stimulating the uh, corpus luteum into develop, uh, making estrogen and progesterone. And uh, later in the pregnancy, stimulating By third trimester placenta makes estrogen progesterone. All right. And of course, estrogen and progesterone are necessary to keep GnRH down. All right. Menopause. As a woman ages, her ovaries become less sensitive to FSH and LH, resulting in ovarian atrophy. As estrogen and progesterone levels drop, the endometrium also atrophies, and menstruation stops. Also, because the negative feedback on FSH and LH is removed, the blood levels of those two hormones rise. This is called menopause. 
So you have increased FSH and LH because sensitivity to them goes down. Profound physical and psych physiological changes actually usually accompany this process, including flushing, hot flashes, bloating, headaches, and irritability. Menopause usually occurs between ages of 45 and 55. Decreased sensitivity to FSH, LH. And usually occurs between age 45 to 55. All right, what are the functions of interstitial cells of Leydig and Sertoli cells? Sertoli cells nourish sperm, and interstitial cells make testosterone, I want to say. Let's double check that. Yeah, they make testosterone. During which phase of meiosis is a primary oocyte arrested? During which phase of meiosis is a secondary oocyte arrested? Well, we happen to know that the primary oocyte is in prophase 1. The secondary oocyte is in metaphase 2. What is an acrosome? What organelle forms the acrosome? Uh, what is an acrosome? It is a, uh, it's the cap that penetrates uh, the oocyte, or the ovum rather. And uh, the organelle that it's made from is the Golgi apparatus. What are the four phases of the menstrual cycle? What are the features and relative hormone concentrations of each phase? Well, in the follicular phase, uh, menstruation happens. Uh, FSH and LH are stimulated or because of low levels of estrogen and progesterone, uh, first GnRH goes up, and then FSH and LH go up, uh, and then estrogen and progesterone go up. So they start low, but they go up because of this phase. In ovulation, because of positive feedback, GnRH and LH and FSH go up, LH induces ovulation. Uh, in the luteal phase, LH stimulates a follicle into making progesterone. Uh, which causes negative feedback on GnRH and LH and FSH. So GnRH, FSH, and LH are back down in the luteal phase. And in menstruation, progesterone goes down. As well as estrogen, FSH, and LH, you can assume, because they're all low to start the next phase. So and there you have it. They distinguish between increasing and increasing greatly, as well as leveling off. They say that LH is leveled off in the follicular phase and the luteal phase. They also do this, estrogen's low and then high. I kind of said that, right? It starts out low and by the end of the phase it's high. All right, discrete practice questions. 
which of the following is the correct sequence of the development of a mature sperm cell? We happen to have this up here. Spermatogonia, primary, secondary, spermatid. Spermatogonium, primary, secondary, spermatid. And then sperm spermatozoa. Looks like B to me. Pretty straightforward. Number one, B. Two, which of the following correctly pairs the stage of development of an egg cell with the relevant point in a woman's life cycle? From birth to menarche, it's in prophase two. At Sounds right to me. No, prophase one, not prophase two. At ovulation, it is in metaphase two. Yes, it's in metaphase two until fertilization, right? So at ovulation. Metaphase 2, not metaphase 1, metaphase 2. At fertilization, prophase 2. No, uh, yeah, metaphase 2 is a secondary oocyte, which is at ovulation. 2C. Three, some studies suggest that in patients with Alzheimer's disease, there is a defect in the way the spindle apparatus attaches to the kinetochore fibers. At which stage of mitotic division would one first expect to be able to visualize this problem? I guess when the nuclear envelope dissolves, you can see them. So right away in prophase A. A researcher wishes to incorporate a radio-labeled deoxyadenine into the genome of one of the two daughter cells that would arise as a result of mitosis. What is the latest stage of cellular development during which the radio-labeled deoxy deoxyadenine could be added to achieve this result? So... Let's go back up here to mitosis. So well, the DNA No, I'm sorry, I was looking at the wrong answers. Right, so... DNA replication. So you have growth in G1, and you got the restriction point to check that the DNA is good. And then you have DNA replication, so you'd have to add it in S, in that DNA replication phase, or else it won't get... You know, there's a check before... Oh no, this isn't a DNA check. This is a DNA check, but this is DNA replication. This is where you're gonna add uh, nucleotides. So S, D. Certain ovarian tumors called granulosa cell tumors are known to produce excessive levels of estrogen. A physician who diagnoses a granulosa cell tumor should look for a secondary cancer in which of the following parts of the reproductive tract. So I guess uh, it's 
So I guess whatever is right after the ovary. So fallopian tube. Endometrium is where I would look, but I think the answer's got to be fallopian tube. They're just trying to get, get you to give the right order. What's after the ovary? Fallopian tube. Upon ovulation, the oocyte is released into the... I think the abdominal cavity, right? Let's double check. During ovulation, maybe I didn't write that down. I think it goes into the cavity, right? Seven. Cancer cells are cells in which mitosis occurs continuously. Wait, so if it goes from the ovary first to the abdominal cavity and then into the fallopian tubes, right? No, endometrium is further down. This is the abdominal cavity. So it's just saying it goes out from the ovary into the abdominal cavity and then into the fallopian tubes. So fallopian tube is still the next step in this answer, but abdominal cavity is before fallopian tube in this set. All right. Cancer cells are cells in which mitosis occurs continuously without regard to quality or quantity of the cells produced. For this reason, most chemotherapies attack rapidly dividing cells. At which points in the cell cycle should chemotherapy effectively prevent cancerous cell division? Well, I guess where the checks are. So I feel like restriction point between <coughs> G1 and S. I mean, so I guess they're going for rapidly dividing. An S stage is not a dividing stage. Both prophase and metaphase are part of that mitosis phase. So I guess two and three. Two and three is what they're looking for. C. Which of the following incorrectly pairs a structure of the male reproductive system with a feature of the structure? So which one of these is incorrect? Seminal vesicles produce alkaline fructose containing secretions. Epididymis surrounding, surrounded by muscle to raise and lower the testes. Vas deferens, tube containing the epididymis to the ejaculatory duct. Cowper's glands produce a fluid to clear traces of urine in the urethra. Cowper's gland, that sounds correct. Cowper's. Vas deferens, tube connecting the epididymis to the ejaculatory duct. 
I mean, that sounds right, yeah. It is a, a tube. Epididymis, surrounded by muscle to raise and lower the testes. It sounds right, too. It's just a seminal vesicle. It's produced fructose. That is the Sertoli cells, right? Seminal vesicles. No, seminal vesicles make fructose. So someone of so it's epididymis that's wrong. Epididymis is the uh, what is the epididymis? This is the epididymis. The part that raises and lowers the testes. Ah, uh, here. In fact, layer of muscle around the vas deferens called the ductus deferens. Not the epididymis, the ductus deferens is the muscle that uh, raises and lowers the testes. So 8B is incorrect. Nine, what is the last point in the meiotic cycle in which the cell has a diploid number of chromosomes? So here's tetrads, so that's diploid. So tetrads align, disjunction pairs are separated. So anaphase two. During interphase, during telophase one, during interkinesis, during telophase two, during telophase one would be when it goes from diploid to haploid. 10. Which of the following does not likely contribute to genetic variability? Random fertilization of an egg by a sperm. Random segregation of homologous chromosomes. Crossing over between homologous chromosomes during meiosis. Replication of the DNA during S stage. So random fertilization does contribute to variability, random segregation of homologous chromosomes. So yeah, what, which uh, side your uh, parental chromosomes go will make a difference. Crossing over also does. Replication of DNA during S stage, that doesn't. That's, I mean, so that could add to genetic variability because you could have like a... Uh, like a mistake in translation, but th I think that's what they're looking for. Typically, uh, there aren't changes being made during S stage. 10D, which of the following statements correctly identifies a key difference between mitosis and meiosis? Let's see. In metaphase of mitosis, replicated chromosomes line up in single file. In metaphase 2 of meiosis, replicated chromosomes line up on opposite sides of the metaphase plate. I mean, I guess that's true. During anaphase of mitosis, homologous chromosomes separate. During anaphase of meiosis 1, sister chromatids separate. 
I mean, I, I think that's... Yeah, that sounds right, too. No, this is wrong. This is the other way around. During anaphylic of mitosis, it's not homologous chromosome. That's when sister. Okay, so this is this is switched around. This is in the right order, at least. No, uh, let me see. Let's let's just go to C. It's not B. At the end of telophase of mitosis, the daughter cells are identical to each other. At the end of meiosis one, the daughter cells are identical to the parent cell. The daughter cells are not identical to the parent cell in meiosis 1. So this has got to be wrong. During metaphase of mitosis, centromeres are present directly on the metaphase plate. During my metaphase of meiosis 1, there are no centromeres on a metaphase plate. That just doesn't sound right at all. It's got to be A. Let's double check that. In metaphase of mitosis, replicated chromosomes line up in single file. In metaphase 2, uh, re replicated chromosomes line up on opposite sides of the metaphase plate. Yeah, that sounds right. Twelve. Which of the following is true regarding prophase? The chromosomes separate and move to opposite poles of the cell. The spindle apparatus disappears. The chromosomes uncoil. The nucleoli disappear. So I want to say nucleoli disappear. But chromosomes uncoil also happens, doesn't it? Or is that in the next phase? Prophase, condensation of chromosomes. Oh, uncoiling happens at the end. Coiling happens. So nucleoli disappear is the one that's right. Nucleoli disappear, D. 13. An individual who is phenotypically female is found to have only one copy of a disease-carrying recessive allele on the X chromosome, yet she demonstrates all of the classic symptoms of the disease. Geneticists determine she has a genotype that likely arose from non-disjunction in one of her parents. What is the likely gen gen uh, genotype of this individual? So she only has one copy, but she's positive. So the other copy, if she had another X copy, then it would fix it point is she's missing her other X so she's got to be just 45 X without the other X if there's another X even if it's Y she doesn't have a Y because she's phenotypically female so it's got to be 45 X 13 C Fourteen. During which phase of the menstrual cycle does progesterone concentration peak? Let's double check. See that that graph is really nice because I know that it's up and then it's up and then it's down and then it's up, right? During ovulation. Yeah, during ovulation. Do they say where exactly these lines are? Is this just supposed to be between proliferative and secretory? These are different stages than these.
No, I guess it's just follicular ovulation. Fetal. During which phase does progesterone peak? Progesterone. So this is LH and FSH, but estrogen is over here, and progesterone is in the luteal phase. During which phase does progesterone peak? Yeah, that's got to be luteal phase, right? So first you have estrogen, then you have LH and FSH peaking right during ovulation. Then you have progesterone strong after, as well as estrogen looks like it comes back after as well. So yeah, luteal phase. 14, C. 15. Which of the following would not be seen during pregnancy? High levels of HCG in the first trimester. High levels of progesterone throughout the pregnancy. Low levels of FSH in the first trimester. High levels of GnRH throughout the pregnancy. I don't think you could have high levels of GnRH throughout the pregnancy. That doesn't sound right. Low levels of FSH, F, FSH in the first trimester. Oh, this is a menstrual, menstrual cycle. This is the wrong. Oh, I don't have one for, uh, I don't have a graph like that for pregnancy. So high levels of GnRH throughout the pregnancy. No. Low levels of FSH in the first trimester. High levels of progesterone throughout the pregnancy. High levels of HCG in the first trimester. You would not see HCG in the first trimester. I know that that's not true. High levels of progesterone throughout sounds good. Low levels of FSH in the first trimester. I guess so. Do you still need FSH in pregnancy? That's for development. Do you still need it during pregnancy? You do. Pregnancy. Blastocyst makes HCG, takes over for LH in making estrogen and progesterone. So you still have the estrogen and progesterone, you just don't have the LH. So low levels of FSH in the first trimester, that sounds fine. High levels of GnRH throughout the pregnancy. I don't feel like you'd have high levels of GnRH, would you? Necessary to keep GnRH down. You want to keep GnRH down throughout pregnancy. Oh, okay. So HCG, you will see it in the beginning. Progest the placenta takes over later in pregnancy. So high levels of HCG in the beginning is fine. High levels of progesterone is fine. Low levels of FSH in the first trimester, that's also fine. But high levels of GnRH throughout the pregnancy, that's not fine. That'll cause you to like uh, menstruate, and you don't want to have menstruation when you're trying to have a baby, right? So let's uh, take this out and put a D in there. And let's check these answers. 1, B, 2, C, 3, A, 4, D, 5 is... C, not A. Estrogen is known to cause growth of the endometrial lining during the follicular phase of the menstrual cycle, and its levels stay high during the luteal phase to promote vascularization and granularization of this tissue. Excessive levels of estrogen may provide a strong enough signal for cell growth to promote tumor formation or even cancer. The other tissues listed in this question, question require estrogen for development, but are not strongly associated with rapid tissue growth 
to estrogen. Endometrium. Yeah, didn't I say that I would have looked in the endometrium? It's because of the nature of the tissue. All right, 6C7D, not C. The question is asking us to determine at which points in the cell cycle we could prevent or at least lower the number of cells undergoing mitosis. One idea would be to prevent DNA synthesis during the S stage of the cycle. Without the DNA being replicated, two viable daughter cells would not be formed. Another idea would be preventing the mitotic cells from occurring altogether in prophase by uh, preventing spindle apparatus formation, preventing the nuclear membrane from dissolving or other process during this phase. Similarly, a treatment that would act on cells in the metaphase stage of the cell would also interfere with the mitotic cell. Therefore, any of the three solutions presented would be a viable option. Seven, you could do stuff in the S stage. I said that only two and three, but you could do all three. Eight, B, nine, B, 10, D, 11 is D, not A. The key difference between mitosis and meiosis primarily appear during meiosis one. Uh, of note, syna synapses and crossing over occurs during prophase one and hom homologous chromosomes is separated during meiosis one rather than sister chromatids as in my mitosis. While the location of the centromeres relative to the metaphase plate may seem a trivial point, it is representative of the fact that homologous chromosomes line up on opposite sides of the equatorial plate in meiosis, in contrast to the alignment of each chromosome directly upon the metaphase plate in mitosis. So they say D, during metaphase of mitosis, centromeres are present directly on the metaphase plate. During metaphase of mitosis 1, there are no centromeres on the metaphase plate. But they're, what they're talking about Okay. So Hmm. Yeah. Uh, while the location of the centromeres relative to the metaphase plate may seem a trivial point, it is representative of the fact that homologous chromosomes line up on opposite side of the, of the equatorial plate in meiosis, in contrast to the alignment of each chromosome directly upon the metaphase plate in mitosis. All right. So there you have it. D, number 12 is D, 13 is C, 14 is C, and 15 is D. All right. Well, that is it for reproduction. Next time, chapter three, embryogenesis and development. Thanks for watching.